Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning to Sorrento Hills Church of Christ as we gather together as one body in Christ to worship our Lord and Savior. Um, and we'd like to spend a, send a special welcome to our visitors. And if you look in the chair in front of you, there should be a card if you wouldn't mind filling it out so we have a record of your attendance. And sometimes we like to play games with our visitors. We may call it three in the afternoon. We may call it three in the morning just to see how you're doing. <laughs> Pretty random. Um, Normally, I would say, if you haven't done so yet, to grab a bulletin, but it appears we are sold out. I was just back there, and there's none left on the shelf. Uh, but there are a lot, of, a lot of good information in there. I'd just like to point out a couple of things. Um, yesterday, we had the work day here at the building, and we'd like to thank all those who were able to make it. It was a great success. A lot of work was done, and I'm sure we'll be having another one sometime in the future in the next few months or so. Um, today, after the service, there will be a Last to Leaders luncheon, and I believe there will be one of those every Sunday this month. And also coming up on March 23rd, from 11 to 2, will be our Spring Carnival. And if you would like to help out or if you need any information, please reach out to Rana. She can help you in that department. And I was given this before I came up here. The Mount Dora Christian Academy and School is having a dinner this upcoming Friday evening. It says 4.30, doors open, and I guess 5.45 is the dinner. The tickets are free. It's a fundraiser. If you would like to attend, just reach out to uh, Kevin and Melanie, and they'll be able to get you a ticket or two if you would like to go. And again, I would say grab the bulletin. It has the sick list, and it looks too large, unfortunately. Um, but one name that isn't on there is Doug. He seemed to have come down with the cold or flu or whatever it is that's been going around that everyone seems to be catching. Um, that is all I have to announce at the moment. Those that are honored to serve this morning, our songs will be brought to us by Buddy. Byron will have our opening prayer. I'll be back up here for the communion. Matthew will be up here to read the scripture, which will be 1 Peter chapter 5. Verses 1 through 4, Brent will be having our clues and prayer, and our lesson the hour will be brought to us by Dylan. Let us begin our worship. Good morning, church. <laughs> We're going to start with 807, I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a
of Prayer, 288. Just a little closer walk with thee. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I Go to our God in heaven in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we bow our heads before you this morning with all humility, Father, and honor as we are blessed to have this avenue of prayer, Father, that we can approach your throne. As we strive this morning here at Sorrento Hills, Father, to be acceptable in your sight. For those things that we do and say this morning, Father, we would pray they would be according with your word. That we would strive here, Father, as we meet with unity and a desire, Father, to please you this morning, to lift our worship in spirit and in truth up to you. As we strive here, Father, in Trental Hills to be not conformed to this world, but be renewed by the transforming of our mind this morning as we have the opportunity, Father, to learn more of your word, to grow in our knowledge and wisdom of your word this morning, that we can draw closer to you this morning and walk closer to you this morning as we go through our walk here on this earth. That we might strive, Father, to make our call and election sure, that we might strive, Father, to be an example to those around us, that those around us, Father, that we come in contact with might be able to see a difference in us, knowing, Father, that we are set apart 
from this world, Father, as we strive to be your servants, as we strive, Father, to be your disciples, that others may want to come to know more about you and to know more about your Son, and that we might have, Father, diligence and the urgency to be able to share your gospel with them. We might, Father, be willing to tell them about your love and your grace and your power as we strive, Father, to set the example that your apostles set before us, that your son set before us, knowing, Father, what should be our number one goal as we strive, Father, to be who you would have us to be in this life here on this earth. Father, we know that this life on this earth is going to be short. It's going to be but a vapor that's going to appear for a little while, and then it's going to fade away very quickly. And we find, Father, that this life can be full of trials and tribulations, and that if we know, Father, we are walking close to thee, that can help us to give us the strength, Father, to, to continue on, the strength, Father, to remain faithful to you and to this life on this earth comes to an end. Thank you, Father, for, Sorrento, for the members here at Sorrento Hills, for our desire, Father, to please you, for our desire, Father, to be of one mind and of one judgment as we strive, Father, to be the bride of Christ, as we strive, Father, to, be, to make you proud of us, to set forth the example as a church here in Trento Hills to those that are in this community. Thank you, Father, for those that are willing, men that are willing to stand before us and uh, participate in our worship, for those teachers that we have, for those that were able and willing, Father, to come to our work day yesterday. So much wonderful things that are taking place here in Sorrento, Father, and we give you all glory and honor for that. Thank you for Dylan, Father, and his willingness to prepare the lesson for us this morning. And we have the desire, Father, to be attentive listeners to it this morning. And we could strive, Father, to apply those things that we learned this morning to our lives and be able to, to share them with others. And thank you for the country that we live in, Father. So many things that you have granted with us for us here on this earth that we often take for granted. Thank you for the clean air that we have to breathe, Father, the food that we have to set on our tables to nourish our bodies. So many things, Father, the clean water that we have. Uh, we are blessed in this country, Father, and we want to give you thanks for that and help us to never take it for granted. We thank you for Jesus and what he means to us. Without him, Father, we would have no hope. Oh, great love, Father, that you showed by sending him to this earth, and we pray, Father, that we would strive each day of our lives to give you thanks for the blessing that we have in him and that knowing, Father, that we cannot come to you with, unless we come through Jesus. We thank you for him and his name that we pray. Amen. As we prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we we'll sing 330, Why Did My Savior Come to Earth? Why did my Savior come to earth?
There's an expression that is sometimes used, I'm sure all of us have heard it, to be the best, you have to beat the best. Whether we're talking about sports, um, someone has to score more points, win more games, win more championships to become the best. And perhaps even closer to home when it comes to our work lives, we have to sell more, we have to get more customers and so on and so on to get the higher pay or to get that bonus. In 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 7, it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Jesus, when he came down to this earth, he lived a perfect life. He followed the will of his father perfectly to a T. And at the end of his life, he was willing to lay down his own life, being that perfect spotless lamb to become that perfect sacrifice on the cross. And in conquering death, he gave us hope. And because of this sacrifice, that expression, to be the best, you have to be the best, doesn't apply to our Christian lives because, because we could never be better than what Jesus was. Hundreds of years before Jesus, men tried to be that perfection, but they were never able to attain that until Jesus came. So in our, sin, in our case, we only expected to be our best instead of be the best. And at this time, we're here to remember Jesus, to remember that sacrifice, to remember his perfect life that allows us as flawed humans to be able to become perfection in our Father's eyes because of his sacrifice and because of that blood he was willing to shed that can wash away our sins. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty Father in heaven, we come to you at this time, Father, to, to remember your son, to remember, remember all that he did for us, specifically, Father, those last few hours of his life to try to understand, try to realize the immense physical and emotional pain and distress that he allowed himself to go through, to be beaten, to be tortured, to be mocked, to be ridiculed, so many things that he willingly allowed himself to go through that he could have stopped at any second if he really wanted to, and to finally, Father, become that perfect sacrifice on the cross, allowing his body to be nailed to the cross and allowing his blood to be shed so that we can, through our imperfections, become perfection in, that, in your sight and that we can have that hope, Father, of one day being with you and your son. Be with us now, Father, as we partake of this bread that represents your son's body that was nailed, nailed to the cross. May we do so in a manner that is pleasing in thy sight. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen.
Almighty Father in heaven, we come to you again, Father, still in remembrance of your son, still in remembrance of those last few hours of his life, and still in remembrance of his willingness to allow himself to become that perfect sacrifice that can wash away our sins. Be with us now, Father, as we partake of this fruit of the vine that represents that, that blood that your son was willing to shed on the cross that our sins, so that our sins could be washed away. May we partake of this in a manner that is pleasing in thy sight. These things we pray in your son's name. Amen. With supper now being concluded, we have an opportunity to give back a portion of that which he has blessed us with. Let us pray. Almighty Father in heaven, we come to you again, Father, now thanking you for all the many countless and undeserved blessings that you have allowed us to have. We thank you, Father, for this wonderful land that we're able to live in, this land of freedom, Father, that allows us to live our lives openly in obedience to you without fear of being thrown in prison or having our lives taken from us. We thank you, Father, that there is so many ways for us to be able to provide for ourselves and for our families the basic necessities of living, whether it be food, whether it be clothing, whether it be shelter. And we just thank you for all these things, but Father. There's so many things that we probably take for granted that so many people throughout this world came and begin to imagine that we have. We Pray, Father, that as we give back a portion of that which you have blessed us with, that we do so with the right frame of heart, with the right state of mind, and that these monies be used, Father, to glorify you and your name, and that we are able to do the work in this community and broaden your kingdom, not only here, but throughout the entire world. And again, Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus, again, for his willingness to leave that perfect glory of heaven to come down to this earth to live that perfect life of example to give those give us those perfect words to learn and live by to become that perfect sacrifice on the cross that can wash away our sins and to conquer death so that one day we may have a hope of being in perfect peace with you these things we pray in his name amen Long before the scripture reading will be 792. <clears throat> the invitation phone will be, uh, what was it? <laughs> Last mile, no. That's not it. I surrender all, 572, if you want to mark your books. Be ahead of me. I don't know what we're singing. Oh, I've lost my place.
when the roll is called up yonder. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair. When the saved on earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those you're in charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you'll receive the unfading crown of glory. That was 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. Good morning. Good morning. We are in 1 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. If you'd like to open your Bibles, 1 Timothy chapter 3. It's great to see some familiar faces that are back with us this morning. I know many of us have been out with some kind of sickness for quite a while, so we're glad to have you back. It's good to see some new faces as well. If you're visiting with us, we're very, very glad to have you. I also want to thank Doug for preaching an excellent lesson last week. On Job, it was very enlightening, and I enjoy anything that Doug has to say, especially from God's Word, so I really appreciate him. We need to remember him as he's home this morning, not feeling well. And I also want to thank all those who showed up yesterday for the work day, and especially those who worked hard, a lot harder than I did, I know. We appreciate you, and we see what you do. And I also want to thank those who work behind the scenes, those who do things that we'll never know about, but without them, the congregation here wouldn't exist, at least not the way that it does presently. So we're grateful for you as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, through the Spirit, lays out the qualifications for the office of a bishop or an elder. And these are not Paul's qualifications, but these are God's qualifications for these men who will serve in this extremely important role in the church as overseers, as shepherds, as what we often refer to as elders. In verse number one, we see first and foremost that a man who's going to serve as an elder must desire to do so. Paul says in verse number one, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, notice he desires a good work. An elder shouldn't be guilted into becoming an elder, should he? It shouldn't be a situation where, well, you're not going to let the eldership dissolve, are you? 
You're not really going to let the congregation down, are you? But instead, it should be a work that he desires to do, but he should understand it is a work. And then in verse number 2, we begin the official list of qualifications. Paul says, a bishop then must be, number one, blameless. And we talked about, that doesn't mean he's sinlessly perfect at all times, because remember, elders are men, after all, and I've yet to meet a perfect man. In fact, I think only one ever lived, Jesus, and none of us were fortunate enough to meet him in person. But instead, a man who's blameless means he is unarrested. You remember in the Greek, the word there is unarrested. Nothing has hold of him, right? No accusation will stick. He's pure in his conduct and in his way of life. And then we saw an elder, also in verse number two, must be the husband of one wife. Yes, that means he can't be a polygamist. But more than that, it means that he exemplifies biblical marriage. An elder loves his wife like Christ loved the church, as a husband should, according to Ephesians chapter 5. If you want to know what a good Christian husband looks like, look at that man. If you want to see what a good Christian marriage looks like, look at that marriage. That's the qualification there in verse number 2. We also saw that an elder must be temperate, verse number 2. And that means he's trustworthy. The Greek word there literally means a guard that you can trust to not get drunk on the job. That's the kind of man you want being an elder. Right? You can trust him to be alert, to be vigilant. He knows what's going on in his life and in the life of the church. Also, we saw in verse number two that an elder should be temperate. And the word there really means that he has common sense. Right? He knows what's going on. Sober-minded, he is level-headed. He'll hold fast to the truth no matter the circumstances, no matter what happens in his life. He's sober-minded. He's got his head square on his shoulders. Now, as we pick up, let's look at the next qualification of an elder. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, look at what comes next on Paul's list. He says that an elder should be of good behavior. That's the New King James Version. If you use a different version, it might read something a little bit different. Some versions say modest there. The ESV reads respectable. I think if we were to try to translate this into a much more modern sense, given a more modern word, we might say that an elder is a gentleman. The way that he carries himself is that of a gentleman. He knows how to behave. He knows how to act around people and interact with people. An elder is of good behavior. And think about it. Would you serve under an elder that was constantly rude and short and gave you the cold shoulder, and never had anything good to say, and who you knew had a bad reputation for this reason or the other? Probably not, right? Probably not. At least not happily. You might do it for the sake of doing it, but, but you wouldn't like to serve under an elder that acts that way, would you? And the idea here of good behavior has more to do with how he behaves than doing good deeds, right? We think of good behavior as you know, doing golden deeds left and right. An elder should do that. But this has more to do with, again, his reputation, being a gentleman. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. A familiar verse, I'm sure. But Peter says there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. We know individuals who absolutely love the first part of this verse. Right? Have an answer, I've got one. Right? I've got something to say at all times, whether you want to hear it or not. <laughs> right? I've got something to say. But sometimes those same individuals don't love the last half of this verse, do they? Where Peter says, do it in meekness and in fear. Maybe you know someone like that. Or they've always going to teach you something. <laughs> you're always wrong, no matter the subject, no matter if they know anything about it. Or you're wrong, I'm right, and I'm going to tell you all 65 reasons why that's the case. And meekness and fear is never part of the equation. But that's not the behavior of an elder. An elder will stand up for the truth, as we saw in Titus chapter 1, and we'll look at verse 9 in just a minute. He'll stand up for the truth. He has a backbone. But he'll do it in meekness and in fear. He'll do it in a gentleman-like way. 
So an elder is, number one, of good behavior. And every Christian, obviously, is of good behavior. In the very next verse, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, in verse number 16, I believe that should say on the screen, Paul says, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior, some translations say your good conduct, in Christ may be put to shame. So as we've continued to see with these qualifications, these are the qualifications of a Christian. And with very few exceptions, this is relevant to each and every one of us. But of course, an elder should be an exemplary Christian. So we all need to be of good behavior. We need to be gentlemen and gentle women in our conduct. Now, what does Paul say next in 1 Timothy chapter 3 on this list of qualifications? He says that an elder must be hospitable. And the Greek word here is actually what we would call a compound word. It's two Greek words kind of put together. And literally, it reads lover and stranger. So what Paul is saying is an elder needs to be a lover of strangers. Right? He needs to be hospitable. And you think about that. That just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? That an elder would be a lover of strangers. He would be hospitable. I remember several years ago, we were at a get-together, obviously at a different congregation. And I don't remember how it came up. But somebody asked another member, have you ever been to elder so-and-so's house? And that person said, actually, now that you mention it, I never have. And then that person went ahead and asked another person sitting close by, have you ever been to elder so-and-so's house? Now that you mention it, actually, no, I never have. And then that person asked another person, have you? No, never been. And he kind of went around the table, and nobody at the table had ever been to this elder's house. And all these members had been at this congregation for, for quite a while, long enough where you would think at least one or two invites might have come their way. <laughs> Maybe one or two dinners, one or two get-togethers should have been hosted. Something should have happened in the vein of hospitality. But no one had ever been to this elder's house. And it's a tragic situation. I think as we think about qualifications of elders, we get hung up on usually the bigger ones. Right? How are his kids? How is his, his, his relationship with his wife? Right? Is he a decent enough person? But what about hospitality? That one kind of gets lost in the shuffle, doesn't it? An elder must be hospitable. He'll visit you in the hospital. He'll come to your house when you're sick. He'll make it to your kid's t-ball game if he can. And he'll show up. He'll make an effort to get to know you. He wants to have a relationship with you that goes beyond just a good to see a handshake on the way out of the auditorium on Sunday morning. This is a man who you know cares about you. Because being hospitable will help him in two ways. Number one, most obviously it will help him shepherd the flock. Now, as we said, the word here means a lover of strangers. We would hope there'd be no strangers to the elder in the congregation. The elder hopefully will know the flock, at least know your name and a little bit about you, you would think. But still, hospitality, when shepherding, goes a long way, doesn't it? You want to know that an elder cares about you. If elders are charged to rebuke and correct, you want to know that they care about you before they do that, don't you? And how many times have you maybe heard of an elder rebuking somebody, righteously so, someone who needed to be corrected, but that person then gets mad and leaves the congregation, and everyone scratches their head and wonders, I wonder why. I wonder why this person left. I wonder why they were so sensitive. Well, maybe that harsh rebuke is the only thing that elder has ever said to that person in the last year. And that person doesn't think this elder cares for them. They just wanted to be mean-spirited and Contradict them. Be cruel to them. Right? So an elder's got to be friendly. The old saying goes, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's absolutely true. Also, as we think about congregations, we know that sometimes, we won't call them cliques, but sometimes in the congregation, friend groups <laughs> kind of form, don't they? Sometimes it's based on age. Right? Young people hang out with the young people. Not so young people maybe kind of congregate together at times, or maybe it's based on interests. You know, we've got this common goal, this common interest, so we just tend to talk after services, before services, and we've kind of got our own little group going on. That happens kind of naturally. But an elder who's hospitable won't belong to one group, will he? Right? An elder who's hospitable isn't going to talk to the same four people every Sunday, is he? 
He's going to make sure that everyone in the congregation gets to know him. And then secondly, being hospitable will help an elder spread the gospel. As we said, no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. That's true in the church, and it's more true outside the church. You can't share the gospel with people before you get to know them, before you become a lover of strangers, before you care for souls. So number two, Paul says that an elder is hospitable. He's hospitable especially to those who are without, but to those who are within as well. And every Christian should be hospitable. In Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse number 9, in my Bible, this is listed as uh, the uninspired heading is behavior of a Christian. So there's a lot in here that's not relevant to being hospitable, but it's a short passage that I absolutely need to share with you. He says, beginning in verse number 9, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, in honor giving preference to one another not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, and then notice distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. And this is instructions to all Christians, not just elders. And so the story that I told a moment ago about that group sitting at the table, none of which had been to the elder's house, Scripture says we all should be hospitable. So if a group was gathered and the same question was asked of me or you, have you ever been to Brother So-and-So's house? What would the answer be? Are we a lover of strangers? Are we a lover of, of one another? Are we hospitable? The next qualification that the Spirit sets forth in 1 Timothy chapter 3 of an elder is that he's able to teach. An elder must be able to teach. Now, I've seen some congregations take a pretty loose approach here. I've seen congregations have a man in mind to be an elder who meets apparently every other qualification, but, you know, he's never really taught a Bible class. He's never preached a sermon as far as I know. He's never sat down and studied the Bible with somebody, but, you know, he does have a mouth and a brain and two legs he could stand up on. So technically he is able to teach, right? (laughs) He hasn't done it, but... He could, in theory. He's capable. If no one else showed up on Sunday morning and somebody had to give a lesson, I guess he could do it, right? But that's not the idea here, is it? That's not the kind of elder that Scripture wants, is it? Instead, Scripture demands an elder who is apt to teach, as some translations say. He's got an aptitude for it. Not only can he do it, but he likes to do it. And he does it regularly. Someone has asked, how do you know if a man is apt to teach? Well, because he's done it, right? The only way you know is if a man has stood up to teach or, or sat down and shared the Scriptures with somebody. The Scripture is not demanding that this man be an Apollos, the most eloquent speaker of all time, the most captivating presenter, but he's got to have the knowledge to teach. He's got to have the desire and the willingness to teach. And it's got to be something that when you think of this man, you think, teacher. I've learned something from that man. Or every time he stands up to speak, I know the scriptures will be opened before me, and I'll be better because of it. So an elder must be apt to teach. He must be able and capable. But I think beyond that, he must desire to teach. As I already alluded to in Titus chapter 1 and verse number 9, this is Titus' version of the qualifications of elder as he draws to a close on on his list, which, Lord willing, we will get to. But this is what he says, speaking of an elder, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and convict those who contradict. Well, what is exhortation and convicting others? That's teaching, right? That's teaching. So elders ought to be able to teach. And as we've seen, Christians should be able to teach, shouldn't we? The Great Commission, as we often call it, in Mark chapter 16, verse number 15, what does Jesus say? It's directly to the apostles, but indirectly to us. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's for me and for you, isn't it? So we all ought to be apt to teach. And that doesn't mean we all stand up on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, but we need to be able to share the gospel with people if and when the opportunity arises. Next on Paul's list, he says, Elders are not given to wine. 
And this opens up a big can of worms that we don't have all, enough time to really dive into all the way. But it's clear here that Paul is talking about alcoholic intoxicating wine. Right? Sometimes in Scripture, wine, the word wine is used to refer to simply unfermented grape juice. Sometimes it refers to alcohol. And it's clear in this case it refers to alcohol. If you use the ESV, your version says that he's not a drunkard. The New King James says not given to wine, but ESV says he's not a drunkard. In other words, he doesn't drink, does he? He abstains from alcohol. And while we're on the subject, I'd be remiss if I didn't take a moment to cons consider and, and discuss briefly the fallacy of drinking in moderation. Many believe that it's okay to drink as long as it's just a little bit. As long as I don't become you know, a raging alcoholic overnight or you know, beat my wife or kick the dog or anything, I can drink a little. It'll be all right. But there's two problems with that. Well, there's more than two problems with that, but there's two I'll bring up in the time that we have this morning. The first is not everyone can drink in moderation, can they? Some people, sure, they can have a glass of wine after work or something on a Friday and never think about alcohol again until a few days or a week or a month passes. Alcohol is never in their mind. It's just, sure, I'll have a drink with dinner every once in a while. But for some people, one drink leads almost immediately to a lifetime of addiction, doesn't it? For some people, there is nothing moderate about their drinking. Some people just have addictive personalities. And some people get very addicted to alcohol. I recently read the memoir of the popular author Stephen King. And in that memoir, he talked ex pretty extensively about his awful battle with drugs and alcohol, and specifically about his alcohol addiction. He said this. I think it's worth sharing. He said, My nights during the last five years of my drinking always ended with the same ritual. I'd pour any beers left in the refrigerator down the sink. If I didn't, they'd talk to me as I lay in bed until I got up and had another and another and one more. That's addiction in a nutshell, isn't it? You just can't stop thinking about it. It consumes you. And what's the problem here? Well, you don't find out that you're addicted to alcohol until what? You start drinking it. And then it's too late. The second problem with moderation is, well, I won't drink until I'm drunk. Right? I'll just have a I won't cross the line. Well, you've got to drink three glasses of wine, three beers, before you find out it's that much it gets you drunk, right? <laughs> You only find your limit through exploration. <laughs> and if you ask people who, who moderately drink, you know, has one drink ever turned into two? Has two ever turned into three or four? I think without fail, everyone would say, well, yeah. You know, dinner went on a little longer than I thought. The wine was flowing a little more than I realized. And yeah, I drank more than I should have. Moderation is not only a slippery slope, but it's a very dangerous one as well. So alcohol is not good for an elder. But alcohol is not good for anybody. I think about my dad. My dad was and I is an alcoholic. Uh, every time I think of my dad, he's got a Budweiser in his hand and a cigarette in the other hand. And I Hey, my mom had had enough with my dad and his drinking and all that comes with it. And so she said, look, you either stop drinking and you stay or you keep drinking and, and go. And this was, of course, before my mom was a Christian. My dad wasn't a Christian. My dad chose to go. That's what addiction does. And I remember growing up, the bane of every father who's left their child is, is child support, right? And I remember growing up, child support, you know, would come sporadically, but then my mom would get a phone call. Please, can we just lower the 
for child support to, to X amount. And my mom, I don't know, big hearted or, or what, would agree. And that amount would come maybe once or twice, and then it would stop, and then another phone call. Can we lower it to just this amount? And I remember by the time I was 11 or 12, I think it was like $50 a month, <laughs> child support. And only that came a few times. But what I do know is that my dad always had a case of beer in the fridge and a carton or two of cigarettes on the table. Alcohol has never done anything good for anybody. And my dad wasn't abusive or anything like that. I think most people would call him a happy drunk. (laughs) But I can tell you that even happy drunks come with problems, don't they? So alcohol is never good, not for an elder, not for any Christian. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8, Paul said the devil is roaming about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. So what should we do? He starts that verse out by by saying, be sober, be vigilant. So we all must be sober. And the last one we'll talk about this morning, which goes right in line with abstaining from alcohol, is he says that an elder is not violent. An elder is not violent. I think we see the connection there. I think there's a reason this one immediately follows not given to wine. Because sure, there are happy drunks, as they're sometimes called. But then there are drunks who are not so happy. (laughs) There are some who, just the slightest bit of alcohol makes them angry for some reason. And obviously, that's not the conduct of an elder or any Christian. And this obviously entails physical violence. The King James says, no striker. I kind of like that a little bit better. An elder is no striker. <laughs> if there's a disagreement, he's not going to resort to throwing punches. But I think even deeper than that, it's the idea of mental and verbal violence. I don't know if any elder, or I would like to think any member of the church would ever come to blows <laughs> over anything, but I know that violence of the tongue... <laughs> is not in short supply. The moment there's a disagreement, the moment there's an issue, right, I'm going to tear you apart with words and make you feel like you're about this tall. Right? But that's not the conduct of an elder. And an elder's not given to violence. He's no striker physically, but especially verbally or in his mental attitude. As we consider these qualifications... I'm sure we're thinking in our minds, what men in this congregation fit these qualifications? What men, as we look around so far as we've seen them, match up to these qualifications? And that's a good thing. We should be thinking that. But before we do that, we need to ask ourselves, do I fit these qualifications? Am I hospitable? Am I, as we've already talked about, blameless? Am I not given to wine? Am I not violent, not physically, but verbally in my attitude? Am I able to teach? Have I ever taught? Am I of good behavior? Do I meet the qualifications of a Christian? I hope so this morning. But if not, if you examine your heart and you know that you're falling short in some way, we're here to help you in any way that we can. If you're not a Christian, we're here to study with you and show you what God expects of each and every one of us. So please, if you're subject to the invitation, come forward as together we
guidance and what we need to think about and all of us. <clears throat> We're going to sing uh, The Last Mile of the Way, 947, just one verse. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I walk Most holy and heavenly Father, we thank you for another day that we can come worship you in truth and for your son's sacrifice. Be with us as we go out through this week that we will continue to be uh, the best Christians that uh, we can be, that we will take the words that we heard, that we will uh, instill it in our lives and to others as well. Be with the ones who are not uh, able to make it, uh, being under the weather, uh, if it be your will, bring them back to us next uh, appointed time. Be with the ones who are traveling, keep them safe. And again, Lord, we're always thankful for everything you've given us. Guide, guard, and direct us to the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.